Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome to DEFCON CZ uh, 2022. I hope you're enjoying it so far. My name is Lenka I, and I'm the moderator for this session. Uh, so next up, we have Suri and uh, Peru and their managed workloads on disconnected far edge presentation. There will be uh, time for our questions at the end and you can write the questions in the Q&A section. So Suri and Peru, uh, let's get started. Thank you. Yep, I'm Sally. I'm a, a, a software engineer at Red Hat, and I've been working on this project for a few months now on Microshift. It's really exciting, and uh, that's what we're here to tell you about. Hi, I'm Parul, and I work uh, with Sally on the same team, and we are very excited to talk about this uh, project. So we'll start with the agenda of just talking a like, little bit about uh, edge computing and the challenges that come with this ecosystem. Then we're going to introduce a project, which is uh, Microshift and where Microshift fits in this uh, edge computing ecosystem. Then uh, we are going to dive a little bit deeper into Microshift, the architecture and what the production deployment looks like and what are the different ways you can deploy Microshift and have your workloads running. And at last, we have something interesting for the developers, which we call Microshift AIO, and we'll talk about that later. So um, first, let's see what is edge computing and where it is used. Edge computing is most of the time when you have very limited storage, very limited network, and you want to bring computing close to the storage that's most of the time we refer as edge computing. It is highly used in micro data centers. Again, uh, when I to say micro data centers, they are small footprint data centers and uh, they have everything that you need to run the application, all the stack. And example would be 5G or IoT or static streaming um, when in a content delivery system. The other is the embedded system, which is automated vehicles, uh, your at home devices. And for this presentation, specifically, what we are going to talk about is field devices, that is devices that are deployed in uh, far off fields, and the, you can think of them as drone or satellites. So uh, just to get a context of what is field deployed devices, when we refer to field deployed, we are talking about a plug and go provisioning and replacement mechanism. So basically these devices are remotely uh, deployed and they are most of the time uh, not recoverable and they must not break or break uh, easily. They also work on very expensive and uh, sparse network and most of the time they have no physical access security. And these devices are usually single board computers or system on chip, think of them as your Raspberry Pi. So whenever we are talking about field deploy, deploy devices, we are referring to mass deployment and operations in remote, which are un, uh, which you at, at uncontrolled locations and have highly challenging network connectivity. So think about um, a camera that is deployed on um, uh, on a ship or like uh, on a drone that is deployed far north to south in and exploring glaciers. <laughs> So, so in contrast, when we are talking about the conventional highly controlled data centers, they are always available on high available infrastructures and they have very stable power and network condition. But uh, the problem is we want to have uh, uh, Kubernetes. Oh, this is, I got this. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so the problem, what, so what's needed? It's, how do you manage update transfer data to and from these remote edge machines and also still use those tried and true and familiar patterns of cloud native deployments like Kubernetes, OpenShift? Um, they're low resource machines. They don't have enough resources to run even a single node Kubernetes cluster. Um, they're sometimes disconnected or um, undependable connecti connectivity. Uh, and you still want to run cloud native workloads. Um, you might need to manage your application and, and workload separate from the underlying operating system, which you know is the opposite of like what OpenShift does. Um, or an RPM OS tree operating system where you embed the workload RPM, but again, limited resources and, and how do you update 
update them cleanly and um, as and so the problem again like the, the world we're in this time period where everything is being instrumented and further and further from the data center um, we're, we need to harness process analyze these the data from these um, far off edge devices uh, like drones smart cars field devices oil rigs sensors it's a huge opportunity uh, with this instrumented world. We can't even imagine like what problems this is going to solve for our society. Um, but we need to solve this problem of how to utilize this data, how to analyze, how to process, how to get it. And uh, yeah. So uh, the solution is we want best of the both world. We want to have Kubernetes and Kubernetes like orchestrating platform to manage workloads because uh, develop and even like you want to use Kubernetes or cloud native uh, tools to develop your de applications for edge. So we have to bring Kubernetes uh, to edge uh, devices, but all of the time, these edge devices, they're managed by device management system and uh, that manage your OS and the underlying hardware. So we want to integrate both uh, this application development flexibility using cloud native application based on Kubernetes. And we also want to provide uh, uh, device management functionality that manages and updates the OS. So uh, you can see on the left hand side, you have the niche cases where you have uh, uh, deployments on the devices and they are just managed by the OS and on the right hand side you have like high availability cluster with high capacity on which Kubernetes workloads are uh, running so that can be handled by OpenShift so where MicroShift exists and most of the challenges that we have been talking about up till now is the challenge in this intersection where you want to have Kubernetes on uh, field devices, but you have very limited options as of now in the industry. So uh, let's introduce the this open source project that we've been working on. It's called MicroShift and it is uh, it's a it is it has not been productized so far. It's an explorative project that we work in the Red Hat Office of CTO. And the goal behind this is to repackage OpenShift core components like your router, your DNS, your storage prov provider, uh, etcd, all into a single tiny binary, which as of today is 160 megabyte without compression. So um, MicroShift is a monolith that it provides all or nothing start stop behavior and it uh, works with system d and podman that enables fast restart uh, and stop time the downtime is very less as you will see in our demo and here is uh, when i say monolith here's what i'm talking about so you have a cluster management tool that you can use to manage your kubernetes application which in our case is uh, uh, we, we are using Kubernetes APIs, basic APIs like etcd, cube API server, and some OpenShift components. And then you have the MicroShift container that contains everything from your binary. Uh, MicroShift binary contains everything. It contains the Kubernetes components as well as some add-ons OpenShift components. And when you run MicroShift, you are just running it on the OS and your workload is running on the OS itself. They don't work inside MicroShift container. They are directly hooked on the, the container runtime. In this case, we are using Cryo on the OS itself. And then you can have a fleet manager that can manage all your fleet deployed devices. So um, what we microchip does it simplifies changes including updates and rollbacks uh, and it obviates or it removes a cluster operators to orchestrate components and mind you it's only the cluster operators you can still run operators as workloads on your microchip cluster but we have removed the cluster operators and the lower level operators at the machine config mm -hmm. so as opposed to um uh, so on the other side, there's OpenShift or Kubernetes, where um, all of the components and operators, they're their own stacks. They're managed by Kubernetes, highly resilient. It's, um, you know, a problem in one doesn't take down the whole the whole cluster. Um, and OpenShift takes us to the extreme where everything is managed by operators and even the operators are managed by 
an operator. Um, so in the in the red over on the left, OpenShift, you can see it's it's meant for scale orchestration, and micro, MicroShift on the right, it's it's meant to run Kubernetes workloads, but on extremely limited resources. So digging digging down a, a bit further. Um, oh, next slide, please. You can see uh, the MicroShift container. It includes. Uh, the MicroShift binary, which embeds the controller, the core controller logic, like etcd, cube API, um, we include OpenShift API, and uh, I can't really read that. Do you, can you guys read that? Um, controller manager. And it utilizes Cryo running on a host machine. Also on the host machine, a Podman volume um, can save the cluster state. And all of this can easily be managed by a systemd service that wraps a podman command with those volume mounts and, and um, permissions. Besides the core controllers, MicroShift binary also includes manifests and references to um, the add-on components that the um, you know, MicroShift architects uh, think that most people will need, such as the OpenShift service CA controller that um, manages TLS certs and the OpenShift router and uh, like a storage provider. So um, next slide. And how how is this created? Well, it um, MicroShift uses OKD. It, it uses the OKD release image and the OKD source code. Uh, the, the, the actual etcd kubelet API server um, logic is vendored into the MicroShift um, binary. And also the, the OKD component manifests that are found in the release image, as well as the um, digests of the individual uh, add-on images, those are also included in the MicroShift binary. And uh, yep, I think that's it for that slide. So, um, what so far what we are trying to say that when you are deploying or when you're running workloads in edge computing platform, you have multiple choice and what is the right choice for you. So we have designed a simple decision tree that can help you decide that. So you can have a full, if you want to deploy a target, you have two options. Is it a servers in controlled environment? And if that's the case, you have rel core as an open shift that's on the right hand side of this decision tree. And uh, we are not going to cover that because that is not our agenda. So if you are deploying servers in control environment, go with open shift, be it a single node or the whole open shift, that is the choice or the best route to do. But if you are field deployed, devices, your option is you're going to use RHEL for Edge, and then you see what kind of workload you're going to run. Are you going to run a workload that comprises uh, OCI containers? Does it need pods? Does it need Kubernetes? Is it using Kubernetes? And if that is your answer, you can use RHEL for Edge plus MicroShift. But if you're just running containers and pods, you, have, uh, you can make another uh, diversion in the decision. Do you need the ability to cluster? Do you need horizontal scaling? If again, if that is your uh, workload would need that, then again, you can go with MicroShift because with MicroShift you can scale. And if it's just a static workload, let's say that is just uh, running a simple process, then you could just use rel for edge with Podman. Yeah, and uh, again, the, the cloud native ecosystem it, you know, MicroShift can use those tools, um, those add-on tools that you would use with any Kubernetes cluster. So that's also a really important um, benefit to using MicroShift. So there are two models that you can deploy MicroShift. The first is RPM install, where you install an RPM package and it will set up your SA Linux and it will install your dependencies. Uh, and it would manage everything through RPM Package Manager. The second option is Podman with Systemd, that what we are going to cover today. Uh, the one caveat with Podman with Systemd is you need to install Cryo uh, yourself. And that is one uh, configuration that you would have to do, which was to 
trade-off for like the entire cluster operator. So like with, with Microsoft, you do have to do some low level sys admin configuration, but they're very minimal. And, uh, but that was required to keep the binary as less as 160 uh, megabyte. So the second option is Podman with systemd uh, that uses host cryo and we are going to cover that in a, uh, in a demo. So uh, the Podman deployment depends on uh, your immutable OS, which as of now we have Fedora IoT and Rel for Edge. We did the demo on Fedora IoT and uh, uses uh, it uses Podman to deploy and manage containers using System D. Uh, I have attached to the link. If you have access to my slide, you can go to this link, which is a very good blog by Podman team on how you can start, stop, restart, auto update, and roll back uh, containerized application using Podman System D features. And uh, yeah, let me play. Yeah, yeah, and uh, it doesn't have to run on on an RPM OS tree based operating system. It just you, you know, it it can, and, and most people in production would. But I always run Microsoft on Fedora. Yeah, it definitely you can uh, do it in the production scenario. You would definitely do an IoT device, but. Uh, those who have worked with IoT, they know the challenges of you. I mean, I was trying to do it. It's very difficult to provision through the community SSH key provider. So you have to create your own ISO image. Uh, that's that's all background. So let me see if I can. It's a very short video, just for one minute, that will show uh, how you install Pod uh, Microsoft using Podman. So nice. just uh, I call the binary and I copied it to the uh, system the location and after that it is just one line where you enable the service yeah I had to make some typo otherwise <laughs> it will look too real right <laughs> it's not fake because it's there are typos <laughs> So I started this Microsoft containerized service that is running a system D as you can see. And um, now uh, this, you can also see this as Podman PS with my internet. This is real, re real, 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 not at all fake. <laughs> It was just the minute, right? You can you can say what was in it because hopefully yeah, no, exactly. It. So you can also use Podman commands to see it. So you can see that the node is now up. It was uh, available six seconds ago, and uh, the pods are available. All of them you can see they are running. And I can I will also stop the service and restart it to see that the downtime is really low like now you can see I cannot find the cluster so I'll just restart the service and within a minute it's uh, restart all my workloads and as as we mentioned that the workloads are saved on a podman volume so the state of the workloads are not lost even when they are stopped and uh, as soon as you restart it it picks up the state from uh, yeah, so you can see that it was started 80 seconds ago, but the state, it's two minutes. That means it's uh, picking up the same state. I wanted to show the auto update as well, which I've shown, but nothing would happen because my images are already updated. <laughs> I, <laughs> while recording this presentation, I did a system prune, very bad idea. So basically what happens <laughs> when you do Podman auto update dry run, what it will see, it will show you what is the uh, digest of the con container image on your local system and what if that image uh the, if that tag with that uh if the digest, the digest of the tag that you have on your local system is different than the digest of the same tag remote then podman auto update would just update that image yes. but right and, now uh, it, yeah it won't work for real, sorry i just want to i want to clarify so there's two options you can do auto update equals local or auto update equals registry so Podman has the choice and like in the in the unit file, we use auto update equals registry. So if the digest is different in the registry, it will automatically restart to that new, um, the new updated image. But Perul is using local on her local system. Yep. <clears throat> so uh, next slide. Oh, is this me? 
Yeah. All right. So this is a slide that I just, and I'm glad we have a few minutes left to talk about it because I have uh, like a side campaign with Microsoft where I want to spread the word that it's an, it's a very convenient tool for developers. Uh, there's a flavor of Microsoft that along the way of developing this, you know, edge production use case, um, uh, the, a flavor of Microsoft known as Microsoft AIO came about. Um, and it, it includes everything in the Microsoft container that we talked about, but also it containerized cryo. So literally all you need on your host system is the ability to run Podman. And um, when you start the Microsoft AIO image, you have the full Microsoft um, environment up and running. So it's really convenient if you're developing an application and you want to quickly spin up an environment to test um, deploying the application on, especially if it's an OpenShift specific application because it has the OpenShift API. So you can use security context constraints or routes or even projects. Um, and, and another use case that has has come, come up um, over the past month, like because this is a really new project, is the using it in CI. If you don't have that need to run a full OpenShift or Kubernetes cluster to test your applications, um, using a Microsoft AIO in your CI pipeline can save a ton of resources and, and a ton of time, actually. Uh, so yeah, I think I had notes, but I want to make sure I said everything. Yep, you have yep. to share for the demo. Yeah, yeah, so let me, I have a quick, um, like again, one minute demo to show how fast and, and easy it is to get up and running with AIO. And I hope you all go and try it. Um, where's my sharing? Um, oh. It's that TV on oh. the, yeah. And how come I can't share YouTube? How come the YouTube link isn't there? I mean, it's fine, but. I mean, you can share your tab, Chrome tab, and then just play yeah, YouTube on idea. that tab. Very good idea. <laughs> Uh, just one sec. Yeah, someone has asked this question, what fleet managers are you using Microsoft ah. with? We don't use, and I mean, uh, we don't use any fleet manager. Uh, it is usually used to manage the devices, but Microsoft would be running on those devices. So we don't have a recommendation. We let the customers decide whatever is of your choice. But Microsoft does not depend on the kind of fleet manager you would be using. Okay, I'm ready. Sweet. So, um, oh, nice. I can play it from right here, I think. Very cool. All right, everyone can see it? Yes, I can. Cool. So this is a, the, the, the video is linked in our slides that we'll share. Um, and there's a bit in the beginning that gives like a step-by-step -step overview of the Podman command that we use and the unit file. Um, we just don't have time for that. I just want to show you the, um, the footage of running it. So here we're going to start Podman. We're, we're going to start um, copying the systemd unit file. And you just start the service. And you can see it comes up right away, Microsoft AIO. Uh, so now you have your Microsoft AIO container running. And if I exec into it, oh, there's the Podman volume and the mount on your system. If I exec into that container, you can see, and, and I didn't mention this before, but conveniently OC and kubectl and the kubeconfig is already set. So again, you just launch this image with, Pod, with Podman or systemd and you're up and running. And when you exec in, uh, you can see that I, in, in under a minute, your cluster is up. And again, um, the embedded controllers like Kubelet and API server, you don't see them listed as separate pods because they're all included in the Microsoft binary. But these are the add-on controllers like that server CA controller, our host path provisioner, um, OpenShift DNS, yeah. Yep, so basically if you have worked with Kind, oh, it is way okay. faster than Kind. And if you have worked with CRC, you would know how easy it is to do it. Microsoft. So it's not a replacement of code ready containers or kind, but it is a very fast way to get start developing your 
cloud native yep. and Kubernetes application. And then yep, you yep, can yep. just push your images and if you have Microsoft running in your production uh, with systemd that whenever your workloads are updated it would update your whenever you update your Microsoft your underlying workloads will also be updated mm -hmm. yeah so another question yeah. can I run install op operators and custom API yes you can run operators as a workload what we meant that you cannot have cluster level operators uh, but you can always run standard operators and API servers inside Microsoft. Anything that is yep. built in Kubernetes, you can run inside Microsoft. Uh huh. And um, um, in this demo, I want to show you can also ac access the Podman. Um, you can access the kubeconfig from outside the container. So here I'm on my just local host, and I copy the kubeconfig out and um, change the ownership. And now I can just run from my local host. Um, you know, if I have my my Git repo with my application I want to try out here, I'm just showing you that it actually works. And um, and you can, I think the next up, I'm just going to stop it and restart it. And you can see when I restart it, it instantly starts up because the Podman volume is intact. And the test containers that I just launched are there. And yeah, that's it. So when you um, thank you, thank you, Sally and Perul. I'm so sorry to interrupt, but we are running run out of time. But of course, uh, you are everyone welcome to join um, our uh, awesome speakers uh, at the work adventure. So thank you, and um, in a few minutes uh, there will be a next session about onboarding edge devices. <laughs>